Hello, this is Mr. Smith again with Honors Government 2, Comparative Government, Lecture Part 3 on English Constitutionalism. And first of all, it's important to point out English Constitution, British Constitutionalism, what's the difference between all these? Well, we use them often interchangeably, but England specifically refers to where the English live, which is only part of the British Isles, as opposed to the other parts, which include Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, which all today are part of the United Kingdom. The other part of that, of course, would be the Republic of Ireland, which is a separate country. Great Britain is, of course, these three parts, England, Scotland, and Wales. So British constitutionalism, English constitutionalism, uh, really, of course, it all took root within London and the parliament there. But as of today, the British parliament or the British system of constitutionalism governs over all parts of the United Kingdom. And of course, what we know today about the British system and that we're familiar with from international news is that the prime minister is the head of government while the queen is the head of state. In the United States, this position, these two positions are shared both by the president of the United States, but in many other countries, they're actually held by two separate people. The queen is simply a figurehead or chief representative of the world and is head of state, while the prime minister is the chief executive of the government, also known as head of government. The prime minister also, unlike in the American system, is part of the legislative branch as well. So the prime minister actually represents a specific district inside the United Kingdom, representing there and getting elected by those people. And then they're chosen as the party leader, which means when they're in the majority in parliament, they also hold the position of prime minister. So they're both in the executive and legislative branch at the same time. And here you can see some of the prime ministers that have existed in the past with the, two of the more prominent ones in recent memory, Margaret Thatcher of the Conservative Party and Tony, Tony Blair of the Labor Party. The United Kingdom, of course, has changed over the years as it's become more diverse, more reform-minded, a better representative of the electorate, and more participatory in that a variety of people have now been elected to parliament and have participated in both parties in government. There have been at least two women now that have been prime minister, for instance, and there have been people of various ethnicities, ethnicities besides English that have been involved in government, including the Scots, uh, the Welsh people from Northern Ireland, but also others whose family have come to the United Kingdom from other places. Some key events, just briefly, as you can see here in this chart, 1215, the Magna Carta was signed, the first constitutional document, 1532 to 36. The Reformation caused a number of acts of parliament to be used by the monarch in order to establish the Church of England and established common practices between Protestants and those that used to exist within the Catholic Church. 1642 to 1660 was the civil war between the parliament and the monarch. 1688, the Glorious Revolution, when the parliament basically removed one monarch and replaced them with another. 1701, which established parliament's authority to pick a new monarch if the previous one didn't have any children. And then eventually the emergence of the cabinet system with the leading minister being called the prime minister, which would eventually grow into the head of government position that I mentioned earlier. 1832 marked the Great Reform Act, which basically tried to change the electoral system so it was more representative of the people. 1911, the reform of the House of Lords, restricting its power. And 1928, the right to vote for all adults, including women. First, let me start with the signing of the Magna Carta by King John in 1215. King John and other monarchs during this period of time wished to get as many holdings within French territory as possible as descendants of a conqueror that had existed in both France and the United Kingdom, which we that's what we call it today, the British monarchs, of course, wanted to rule over both of those parts. And the only way they could eventually get to that point is if they held more lands and conquered more territory back in France. But you need, of course, soldiers and money and other resources in order to do that. And so King John constantly asked the nobles to help gather soldiers and money through taxation. But of course, the nobles knew that this was a difficult task and they didn't want to turn over these resources. And so eventually they had a slight rebellion and pressured King John into signing the Magna Carta, recognizing their authority, protecting their rights to some extent, so that way they wouldn't be harassed and put on trial or arrested without reason. 
And this was the first step in limiting the king's power. Of course, it wasn't necessarily permanent, and it certainly wasn't for everyone. King John eventually said he was under duress, so therefore it didn't really count. And, of course, as monarchs needed taxation, soldiers or other resources, they had to come go back to the nobles and acquiesce and say, well, yes, we are limited in power. So this kind of went back and forth for a period of time. Uh, but eventually, a council of nobles that then later on down the road included some wealthier commoners that would consult with the monarch, eventually took the name of parliament, and this group of people would also be used by the monarchs, not just to gain resources, but also to curry favor with the people, to spread out blame for unpopular decisions, and so on. And probably two good examples of that would be King Henry VIII. As you know, King Henry VIII was unhappy with the marriage to his first wife after not being able to produce a son. And so he wanted to dissolve the marriage, but the Catholic Church, which was really the Christian church for just about everybody in Western Europe, refused to comply. So King Henry VIII decided, because of the Protestant Reformation, which he originally was opposed to, should instead separate from the Catholic Church and form the Church of England, of which he would be the head of, so therefore he could approve the dissolution of his own marriage. He knew that this would be an unpopular decision. The masses were incredibly religious and loyal to their faith. And so in order to help spread some of this blame around and also keep an eye on the kingdom to make sure there aren't any rebellions, he, of course, used Parliament to help approve the establishment of the church, the fact that he was the head of it, and that, of course, he could make decisions like separating from his wife. The second of his daughters, Queen Elizabeth, later on took over the throne, and she was even more adept as a politician. And she recognized there are a lot of differences between Protestants and Catholics, and it was going to take more effort to convert or at least make the people comfortable with the Church of England. And so she, for instance, established a common book of prayer and an act of uniformity to try to incorporate practices from both Protestants and Catholics. And once again, knew this would be unpopular with some, so she used Parliament to approve this. So each time the monarchs used Parliament kind of for cover, they also gave away some of their own power by admitting that they needed them. And King Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth, amongst others, were part of the Tudor family, and Queen Elizabeth passed away without any children, and so it eventually passed to her cousins, which would include King James I, who was a Scottish noble as well. In fact, he's known as the king of both England and Scotland. King James I of England, King James VI of Scotland. And so he comes to the throne, and he's part of the Stuart family, who has a little bit more of an inkling to take on the divine right of kings theory, that's why they're in office. But he wasn't as serious of a politician or skilled ruler as Queen Elizabeth. And so while he did take the position that he was all powerful, that didn't really come to any type of conflict with Parliament, at least not on a large scale. But that certainly did influence uh, his, aunts, or his descendants, including King Charles I. And when he takes over the throne, he takes also the same position that, well, I'm here because God wanted me to to be here. This is my fate. This is my destiny. And so he is very reluctant to work with Parliament, and he is facing, of course, rebellions in Ireland and Scotland and other places, and so he constantly needs troops and other resources, including money. And so he constantly has to go back to begrudgingly to Parliament to ask for these resources and help in collecting them. Well, of course, Parliament is not going to acquiesce unless they can take more power, basically, away from King Charles I. And so he ends up dismissing Parliament a number of times. In some occasions, they serve for very short terms, and other times they serve for a longer term. In between two of these occasions, he is able, or the Parliament, excuse me, is able to get them to sign what is called the Petition of Rights, which recognizes some of the authority of Parliament, basically the second major document in British constitutionalism. But that doesn't last for long, and eventually he continues to press Parliament, and it doesn't seem like he's necessarily completely come to terms with the fact that they are at least somewhat of an equal power, or at least a power to be reckoned with. And so when there is dissent, once again, within Parliament and criticisms of him, he threatens to arrest some of the members, and this eventually causes him to dissolve Parliament and eventually Parliament and the King go to war over who exactly should have the final say over Parliament's power, control over the British system, taxation, warfare, those kinds of things, and it erupts into the English Civil War. Now, we usually give that title, it was actually two separate ones, 
to make a long story short, uh, King Charles, which leads known as the Cavaliers because they're wealthy enough to own horses. He leads an army against Parliament's roundheads because it was filled with Puritans who had simple bowl cuts for hair. And at first, King Charles, because of his resources and the experienced people, are able to win. But as the Puritan army becomes more disciplined and is eventually led by a skilled general by the name of Oliver Cromwell, he is captured. And when he is captured, he agrees, yes, Parliament's in charge. I'll do whatever you want. And so they take him for his word and leave him go. Uh, but then he goes and raises another army. So some historians refer to this, of course, as the English Civil War, since it's separated by that brief impasse and the capturing of King Charles. But the next time that he's defeated, they end up, of course, capturing him, placing him under arrest, and then deciding to execute him. So King Charles I is no more, which really restricts the power of the monarch since he's dead. Oliver Cromwell takes over and establishes a republic, a system with no monarch. And he institutes Puritan rule, which is a little on the harsh side, banning a lot of activities that people are used to because it looked as unchristian. And even though he basically spends all of his time trying to crush rebellions, especially the of the Irish, which may be based on Catholic bigotry, it, it comes to a time when he is older and passes away, and his son really doesn't want to be in charge afterwards. And so the parliament offers the crown to King Charles II. Now, you might wonder, well, didn't they just kill your father? But, of course, power and nice big castles and a good, a good salary and all those kinds of things kind of trump those previous indiscretions of having your father executed. So King Charles ends up taking the throne. Uh, that is briefly lived, and eventually King James II takes over on the right. And he has been living in France for a long time. They had gone into exile, of course, when the English Civil War was going on. And so he is fervently in favor of Catholicism, especially his wife. And so when they end up becoming pregnant, basically, Parliament and many English Protestants become scared that eventually the country will go back in the Catholic direction. And so that's when they decide to go shopping for a new monarch. And one of King James's own family members, Mary, happens to be wedded to... William of Orange in Denmark, which is extremely Protestant. And so they basically invite them as a couple to come rule over England. Well, James, believing, of course, that William will bring a large army with them and there'll be a conflict, decides to flee, and eventually he leaves England in particular. So inadvertently, you know, you could call this a resignation, absence of office, or Parliament pushed him out or fired him, whatever you want to do. But then William and Mary come to the throne, but in turn, they also promise to sign the Bill of Rights, which strips the monarchy of most of its remaining powers. Now, they do still have some. Technically, they're the ones that make all the government appointments. Technically, they're the ones that sign everything into law. They can veto things if they want to, but monarchs generally don't do this uh, because they're afraid that they'll be stripped completely of the crown and England will be turned back into a republic again. So generally, uh, since the time of around 1700, the veto power of the monarch has not been used, and basically that was set up by the Bill of Rights. And speaking of that, of course, the person who did cast the last veto was Queen Anne, and she is childless, just like Elizabeth before, and so Parliament goes shopping for a new royal family, and they go to some distant relatives in Hanover of what is today Germany, and there they establish the Act of Settlement, which basically says they are the ones that get to choose this new royal family. And so the Hanover family is invited to rule when Queen Anne passes away. And so actually the current British family, royal family, not just because of this, but other people they've been married to over the years, actually has a decent amount of German ancestry. In fact, the Hanovers, King George I, II, and III, which is the one from the American Revolution, were all German. Uh, King George I, in fact, didn't even like England that much. Uh, he would take long vacations back in Hanover, and he did not like the idea of speaking English. But Parliament liked him because he was basically going to do what he was told, and on top of that, he is faithfully Protestant. But once again, there's still significant c Catholic bigotry inside the country. In the meantime, though, obviously the monarchs have to be able to say, we need to be able to work with Parliament, but there are hundreds of people in Parliament. So... How do you manage any type of relationship with them? And so you end up with a key group of advisors 
usually in charge of the treasury, like the, what's called the chancellor of the exchequer. Uh, but then eventually you need to concentrate around one particular leader of parliament who can be your main minister or advisor, who also has a lot of sway within parliament and can get them to vote a certain way. And this position actually wasn't established. There wasn't some big fancy ceremony that happened and a banner dropped out from the ceiling that said, congratulations, we now have a prime minister. This really developed over time, but the first person historically considered to be the prime minister would be Sir Robert Walpole, as you can see here. And he had a mastery organization of parliament, the House of Commons in particular, and had a good relationship with the monarchy was able to get through public policy, specifically dealing with budgetary matters and the treasury. And because of that organizational skill and efficiency, he was considered a main advisor to the king and by historians, once again, the first prime minister. British system would of course constantly change. We're already familiar with the fact they had two stages of discovery and exploration and conquering. One would be the colonial era, which, era, which included the American colonies later on, the imperialist era, which included Africa, India, and other places. And in the meantime, they also experienced the Industrial Revolution much faster than the United States. Northern, what would now be Germany, and Britain experienced an industrialization, what was called the First Industrial Revolution, where they were taking advantage especially of textile machinery and steam engines and other such mechanisms. And this would help catapult their economy along much further. The United States really wouldn't experience this, experience this to such a large extent until after the Civil War, although we did see a little bit, little bit of it before that, particularly in the North. But this changing economy would also change populations as more people move from rural areas to urban areas, towns grew into cities, cities grew bigger and bigger with tens of thousands of people, which of course created all kinds of growing pains, but also advantages, uh, but it also caused a, a need for eventually a change in governing as well. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that they never really changed the system of the House of Commons. This is the lower house, which represents the general population of the people, as opposed to the House of Lords, which was obviously filled with aristocracy. The House of Commons districts, where each member, member of parliament or MP as they're called, represented a specific boundary uh, restricted area, but these areas never really changed as population shifted. So you ended up with members of parliament representing a, a rural area with very few people in it, maybe only a few hundred, but then you had a number of members of parliament that had 10,000 people in their district. So it wasn't a very fair system. So eventually there was a push in the 19th century, not just in Britain, but other European countries as well for massive amounts of reform, constitutional changes, more introduction of representative government. And so that's exactly what would happen. Starting with the Reform Act of 1832, the British system started to push for redrawing of some of these districts to allow more equal representation. It wouldn't happen overnight, and it would be a slow, continual process over time. And remember, at this point in 1832, there's also a lot of people that still aren't allowed to vote within the system as well. But that will be pushed for. Uh, but the, the British system, like America, is conservative. And when I say conservative, I don't necessarily mean on the political spectrum, but that it is slow to change, and it takes a lot of time and compromise. And really, the next system that would end up being pushed would be in the 20th century. The Beveridge Report was published in 1942, which, as you can see by the headline there, pushed for Social Security, old age pensions, more benefits for the people, and so on. And this would be one of the first major pushes to establish the welfare state, especially after World War II was won. It was said, look, not only our military, but the civilians went through a nightmare, especially the Battle of Britain with constant bombings, the amount of rationing that we had to do to make sure our military had enough resources. So people suffered enough, so we, the government should develop policies to help take care of them from cradle to grave. And so this started the development of the modern-day welfare state. And here you can see a timeline that would continue to occur from 1942 to 2008. The aforementioned Beveridge Report was published in 1942. The Labor Party already by this point had risen as a major party. It would be one of the two big ones besides the conservatives. The Labor Party represents organized labor unions in particular, but they're looking out for the working class, so it involved that element of populism. And after World War II is won, they really push, hey, we need to take care of our own people, and that's what got them elected. Uh, interestingly, the war was still going on 
and Winston Churchill, the previous prime minister, was briefly swept out of office by this Labour Party election. And so we started to see the development of the NHS, which provides hospitalization and doctor services. The Conservatives would eventually return to power and the Labour Party would beat them again. And we create this back and forth that continues to happen uh, throughout this period of time. And really the big name, if you look down on the list by 79, Margaret Thrat Thatcher is elected basically saying, hey, even the Conservatives have been going along with a lot of this welfare state, but we need to curtail spending. We need to make sure that we're being fiscally, re fiscally responsible. And we need to make sure that we're not extending social programs too much to interfere with the capitalist system. And counteracting that in 1997 would be Blair. Tony Blair, like Bill Clinton in the Democratic Party, Tony Blair took the Labor Party more towards the center to say, you know what, we need to help keep supporting the people, but we agree with the conservatives, we need to do so in a fiscally or monetarily responsible manner. And so bringing them toward the center caused them to win uh, multiple elections. And you can see they're in office from 1997 to 2007 when his successor, Brown, takes over. And then, of course, 2008 was the beginning of the economic crisis. This timeline doesn't include some of the other events like Brexit, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But going back to Winston Churchill, he was the embodiment of the spirit during World War II that believed in a lot of unity in particular, so it involved multiple parties coming together to support the war effort. Uh, but as that was winding down in 1945, as I just mentioned, he ended up losing the majority, the conservatives did, and the Labour Party ended up being swept into office. So actually, the Soviets and the Americans had been working with Winston Churchill, but by the end of the war, they were working with Clement Attlee, who was the Labour Party prime minister. And so that is extremely possible within the British system that when an election happens, they immediately move the opposition party into leadership. And why they're able to do that is the opposition party has a leader of the party, the opposition leader, that if they win the election, they automatically become the prime minister. And the opposition party also has a shadow cabinet. And so I mentioned, mentioned the Chancellor of Exchequer, which is similar to the Secretary of Treasury here in the United States. The opposition party has a shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. They have a Secretary of De or Minister of Defense, and the opposition party has a shadow Minister of Defense. And they call them ministers instead of secretaries, like we do here in the United States, or at least in, in common phrasing here in America. That's what we use the word minister as opposed to secretary. Uh, but anyway, that way that the opposition party, when they win, they can just move their entire cabinet and start leading from day one after the election. Uh, that's unusual because the American system, as you know, there's kind of a lame duck session in between the election and when the new president or Congress or at the state level governor or his administration or so on are actually sworn into office. And so that period of time is a lame duck, set, duck session where there are possibly people that lost their jobs for instance, in the election are still sitting around in office. That doesn't really happen within the British system. But Winston Churchill will eventually come back into power. So it is possible, as long as you're still leading the party, to become prime minister again later on. And it's really up to the parties if they place any type of limitations on that. But Winston Churchill, he was the embodiment of that conservative patriotic movement that existed because of World War II and continued to exist for a period of time. It was based on respect. It was based on traditions. Winston Churchill was part of this uh, proud middle class, but also had some noble connections. And so this old traditional system that people had deference for to tip their hats toward to believe this is just the better system, this is make, what makes us civilized and so on, that continued to keep people in line despite some of the misery they suffered during World War II and some of the post-war recessions that occurred. There was the condition, of course, uh, too much coal burning and pollution that caused this really thick, disastrous smog that was harmful to people's health that really cluttered the air and you couldn't see even really in front of your face for, for days on end. So when all these problems happened, uh, people continued to respect the government and its institutions because they had this deference toward it. And that would continue for a period of time, uh, but it wouldn't continue forever. British civil participation is still really high and it's respectable and it's, its citizens participate on a great level. But starting in the 1970s, we started to see a change with the outlook. Just like in the United States, there are many criticisms of civil rights and pollution and you know, the lack of equality of women and feminism and 
of course, the view that Britain was still too involved in an imperial manner, sending troops throughout the world too involved with the United States' war games in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And so because of some of that distress, there started to be some upheaval. And the same as in the United States, because of Vietnam and Watergate, there was a little bit of depression that existed within the political culture and a decline a little bit in British patriotism in the 1970s. Now, political parties, primary vehicle participation for over 100 years, the parties pumped out manifestos or platforms. They basically listed all of their goals that would occur whenever they were in office. The Labor Party or the Conservative Party has won all of the elections since World War II, even though there are some sizable third parties. The parties began to change, as I mentioned, in the 1970s, with the parties moving both toward ideological extremes because they had to represent something. Instead of in this malaise and depression that existed in the 70s, they needed to say, hey, we have some new ideas, and they're quite the opposite of the other side, so come look at them. And all major parties have become catch-all parties because as we end up with these two behemoth parties, just like they are here in the United States with the Republicans and Democrats, they're often called umbrella institutions because they cover so many people and so many ideas. Britain also continued to face new economic issues with the 70s, and that would be the fact that they started to decline in economic prominence. Here you can see 1939, their international rank in gross national product per capita, which is the total amount of money or value of the goods and services produced divided by the number of people in a country. Here you can see 1939, they were in second place. By 1960, they were still in the top 10, but by 74, they had dropped to 14th. 18th in 1995, 14th in 2000, and even though they made some progress and they're back up to 8th, that's still a far cry from where they started out in 1939. This, of course, goes along with a decline in manufacturing, outsourcing of jobs to third world countries, increase of finance and services, which don't necessarily always pay that much, and they certainly don't need a lot of those working class factory uh, jobs for the people, and so that has caused some growing, growing pains as well. And this is just a chart of the prime ministers. And there you can see whenever there's a prime minister from a particular party, that means their party's in the majority. And there you can see it's gone labor, conservative a number of years, but that's just because of a change in leadership. And then labor, then conservative, then labor, then conservative, then labor. And so it kind of bounces back and forth. People grow leery after a while. Oh, they're not fulfilling the same promises they had been in the past. Let's make a change and start with the other guys. And then after so many years go by, they feel the same thing about them and switch back. But probably the two people that broke them out of this malaise and out of the old party tricks would be Margaret Thatcher of the Conservative Party and then Tony Blair of the Labor Party. Margaret Thatcher is the one that basically, like Ronald Reagan in the United States, said, conservatives don't be afraid of being conservative. There's nothing wrong with saying we need to tighten our belts and make more financial sacrifice and make sure, making sure that we can balance the budget and that having high taxes and lots of welfare programs is not a good thing because people need to go out and work themselves and earn what they have. And so this British system that had been allowing the welfare state to develop all those previous years in some way or another didn't necessarily get the overwhelming endorsement from the Conservative Party, but they kind of gave their nod to it. Uh, but now she's starting to say, wait, we need to start restraining this. She wasn't saying end the National Health Service, but she was saying we need to restrain growth in the welfare state and try to pull back from that sum. And Thatcher was actually in office for a considerable period of time. There you can see she's there from 1979 to 1990, and then her successor, once she leaves office, is there for another seven years. So it was incredib incredibly popular. And so the Labor Party, after they've been out of office for so long, in the political wilderness, as it's called, because they're in the minority, they don't have any power, they can't get any legislation through, they basically say we need to make some kind of change. So Tony Blair, like Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party in the United States, proposed, why don't we move toward the center? Why don't we agree with the conservatives? Yes, we shouldn't be raising taxes that much. Yes, we shouldn't allow the welfare programs to grow too rapidly. We still want to support them, and that, that will be our stand. We want to make sure we continue to have the National Health Service, that it's modernizing, for instance. We want to make sure workers' rights are protected so they can go on strike and ask for better wages and pay and benefits, because remember, the Labor Party is rooted in unions. And because of this, Tony Blair is able to win elections and be able to stay in office for a decade, give, handing over power to his 
successor Gordon Brown later on. And so Thatcherism and Tony Blair's efforts really have created the two modern parties that exist today for the most part. Although there are obviously still some conflicts and some different opinions that exist in both parties. Uh, but just to focus on this for a little bit, to go back to the actual British system, the House of Commons, which has over 600 members, the goal, of course, is to get a little over 300, so that way you can have a majority in the government. And really when that happens, you can take everything from your party platform and just push it through as long as you have what are called party whips that keep your members aligned, making sure they're voting for whatever the leadership wants. And you can really push through all those platform items as law and get them passed in almost like a rubber stamp effort. And that's why it's so frustrating, for instance, for the Labor Party for a long time to be in the minority because you really can't do anything about this except speak out and participate in debates and vote against them. But otherwise, you're going to lose each time. The British prime minister system, therefore, seems very powerful and it must be easy to get things done, unlike the president, which has to work with Congress. And the president isn't part of Congress. He can't officially propose laws himself. So it must seem like, oh, being prime minister must be pretty easy. But there's some reasons why it's not, why it's disadvantageous. The first thing is that as prime minister, remember, you're representing your own district and you're leading the government at the same time. So Margaret Thatcher, for instance, when she's a prime minister, has to go back to her hometown and run for re-election as that individual member of parliament. And then she also has to stay popular enough with her, within her own party because that's how you get elected. You, you basically are chosen by your party to be the head of your party, and therefore you become prime minister. So she basically has to keep track of those two jobs at the same time. And then when Tony Blair takes over as head of the Labor Party, he has to do the same thing. He has to get re-elected in his hometown as the individual member of parliament and also be be chosen by the Labor Party to be the leader. So that way he can be prime minister. So in that way, it's difficult. Another way it's difficult is that the prime minister is working with her, her or his cabinet. So the minister of defense, the minister of agriculture, the minister of uh, uh, urban affairs or any, any of the other cabinet me members that they have they actually have an, a number of more departments than we do. But these are all important party leaders. They're famous people. They're well known throughout the country and they're all ambitious. They would all like to be prime minister. And so not only does, for instance, the conservative party leader have to worry about the opposition leader, they also have to worry about their cabinet members possibly planning, scheming to expose or leak their weaknesses. So that way they become unpopular within the, within the party. So eventually there's some grumblings. Then eventually members of parliament start, stop supporting the bills. The whips can't control them anymore. And so then somebody calls for a vote of no confidence in the prime minister. And if that happens, if they're challenged, they have to possibly be reelected as head of the party. And that's when a cabinet member can swoop in and say, no, I can do it better. And so not only do you have to watch out for the opposition, you have to watch out for your own cabinet because you might be stabbed in the back by them politically. That's what happened to Margaret Thatcher. She was in office for a very long time. And even amongst the people that didn't like her, uh, there was still an admiration of her being the first female prime minister because she was so tough. She was called the Iron Lady. And this Iron Lady, uh, who seemed to be as hard as metal, couldn't really see some of the problems that were starting to happen in her own party. Uh, part of that belief that people needed to, to work and pay their own way, she proposed uh, what she called a poll tax. That's something different here in the United States. But basically what it was is a flat tax that people had to stay pay to go toward local administration and government. And it was going to be the same amount for every single person. So whether you're not, not you made 10,000 pounds a year or a million pounds a year, you're going to have to pay the same amount. That was seen as incredibly unpopular and unfair to the average people. There were all kinds of protests. Basically, a lot of people in some municipalities or towns just refused to pay the tax, which was going to bankrupt some local governments. And so it was incredibly controversial, and the cabinet tried telling her this. Uh, but she said, you know, we need to be principled like we have been over the last several years and stick to our guns. But eventually she would be challenged, and she would, after realizing she wouldn't be able to hold on to the leadership, she ended up resigning. And somebody else, of course, challenged her. Uh, but eventually, even that person wasn't looked favorably on, and that's why John Major took over instead. And so that's extremely possible to happen, and it happens 
not necessarily with each prime minister, but it is a possibility and it's happened more than once. So that's part of the trick of being the head of government in a parliamentary system. The Thatcher and Blair revolutions have changed the conservative and labor parties for those reasons. The conservative party, as I mentioned before, believes in a lot more belt tightening. And anytime you watch, for instance, the British House of Commons, when they have prime minister's questions, that's when the prime minister comes in at least once a week and answers questions from members of parliament. From their own conservative party members, they could get questions about spending and taxes and are we doing enough? Uh, T Tony Blair and the Labor Party, of course, gets a lot of questions from their own members about are we helping the people enough? Are we doing enough? Are we tightening our belts too much? Now, after Tony Blair, eventually, there would be a far left member, kind of like Bernie Sanders here in our own country, that would take over the party. Uh, but that wasn't the kind of change people wanted, and so the Labor Party hasn't won any more premierships or prime ministerships or parliamentary election majorities uh, since then. So now they, they're in a period in the wilderness where they're trying to find themselves again, so it's hard to tell exactly if the current leader or somebody else later on will end up being the next prime minister of Britain. And of course, the big issue that kind of changed everything would be Brexit. Britain has belonged to the European Union for a long time. The European Union was originally started by Western countries as an effort to open up trade for things like steel and coal in the midst of the Cold War because they wanted to have good economies so that way they would be able to compete with the Eastern Soviet bloc. Eventually this was changed into the European Union which established open borders so you could trade goods and services without tariffs. It also eliminated the need for passports so workers and other people could travel back and forth in Europe. And Britain was included in this but it wasn't always necessarily popular because of the English Channel the British people have always thought of themselves as not as European as the rest of Europe. And so they didn't like the idea of turning over their sovereignty when it came to trade issues. There was some um, concern over workers, especially once Eastern Europe belonged to it later on after the Soviet Union collapsed, about workers coming in and being, being able to work for less and taking jobs from the British people. And so some of these concerns eventually forced through a massive referendum where the British people by a slim margin voted to leave the European Union, commonly known as Brexit. This has caused a lot of controversy because obviously the European Union and all of its regulations and trade deals is massive. I mean, if you print it out, it would be tens of thousands of pages. And so just simply severing ties isn't extremely simple, especially because of this. Ireland is its own country and it still belongs to the European Union whereas Northern Ireland is part of the British system. And so if you say to people, you need passports now to come across the border, you need to pay tariffs if you bring goods and services across the border, that means it will create a solid border here amongst the island of Ireland, which is a problem because if you're not that familiar with Irish history, uh, mostly Protestants live in the North, mostly Catholics in the South. There were both groups on both sides that were extremely radical and used violence because the Northern Irish Protestants definitely don't want to be a part of Ireland. The Catholics that do live in Maine, Ireland and the small communities of them that live in Northern Ireland do want the island to be reunited. And so as part of a peace deal, they basically recognized, even though these are technically two different countries, people could travel back and forth and ship things and so on. Uh, but if Britain, once Britain is done officially leaving the European Union, that brings up the awkwardness once again of, you know, what do we do? Is this two different countries or is it just one happy island? If that happens, if they do recognize that this is one happy island to keep the peace, which has lasted quite a while now, then basically all the people and goods and services can still flow into the United Kingdom through Northern Ireland. So that's a complicated issue that two different prime ministers so far have not been able to settle. Now let me talk briefly about the political parties. I've already mentioned Labor, of course, which is similar to the Democratic Party in the United States, left of center. And then, of course, the Conservative Party, which is right of center. There's also a number of other parties that exist, and here you can, we can see them organized a little bit. The Brexit Party, which really pushed that, is very pro-English in particular, and they don't like the idea necessarily of immigration. Have some critics say that's a little bit racist. They deny that. They say, look, we're just protecting our culture and heritage and the jobs that are here. There's also the DUP, which is the Ulster Party, which is made up of very hardcore Protestants that live in Northern Ireland. 
and then there's Sinn Féin, which is the left-wing Irish party that exists both in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. There's the Scottish National Party, which is more left-leaning than right-leaning. They have them here in the center. But the Scottish, their main objective is to make Scotland independent. And the last time the Scottish had a vote on that, it briefly failed. Or not briefly, but by a very small margin failed. And the main reason why it failed is, is because people from the Labour Party and the Conservative Party went to Scotland and said, hey, if you stay in the United Kingdom, you can still be a part of the European Union. And so Scotland voted to stay in the United Kingdom. And then shortly afterwards, the United Kingdom voted to drop out of the EU. And so Scotland, in the meantime, has been furious because they believe they've been lied to. And so the Scottish party has been pushing, in particular, to leave the United Kingdom so that way they can rejoin the European Union themselves, which is awfully a very big and controversial move. Then you have the Green Party, which, of course, stands for the environment. This uh, plaid party is the Welsh party, basically. And then there's the Liberal Democrats. In the United States, they're called libertarians. They don't like a lot of liberal laws. They don't like a lot of conservative laws. They agree with conservatives sometimes. They agree with the Labor Party sometimes. And they used to be actually just plain liberal, which once again means something different. It means that you believe in a broad amount of rights. You don't believe a lot in a lot of conservative or left-wing laws. And they actually used to be one of the two big parties. It used to be the conservatives and the liberals, but that's changed around the beginning of the 20th century where labor stepped in and took away most of the voting power of the liberals. But here is a chart of the decision-making in Britain. The queen is off out here by her own because technically she approves everything, but as I mentioned earlier, she's just a figurehead, the head of state, and even though she has veto power, she's not going to use it. And the prime minister is selected, of course, and they are the head of government, and they basically command which way the House of Commons, at least the majority party, is going to go. The voters choose the House of Commons, which the prime minister and cabinet are drawn from, technically after being appointed by the queen. And then legislation generally flows. They're the ones that design it. It flows to the House of Commons. They approve it. And then it goes to the House of Lords. And there you can see it says suspensive veto only, which means they only temporarily delay legislation. They technically don't have the power to officially veto anything, at least not on a permanent basis. This exists uh, for a long time of nobility, but that has been changed so that people can be added and they aren't allowed necessarily to give their seat in the House of Lords to their children, for instance, as it used to work in the past. As they've been selected here through the years, you can see if you want to pause this and look closer at the chart, but this breaks it down to conservative votes and the number of seats they have in Parliament, Labor, Liberal Democrats, and so on. Uh, these numbers here in particular, Liberal Democrats, did increase back up to 62 by 2005, but they've declined again considerably. Uh, the Scottish National Party is actually now the third biggest party inside the House of Commons. And there you can see the goal is to get well up over 300 and you can see the periods of time when they had that in the Conservative Party and when they had that in the Labour Party. British voting works a lot like it does here. It's anonymous ballot. You go in, you vote at your polling station. People have certain places where they're registered. The voting system exists within districts, as I said earlier. Uh, there are different levels of government. There's the national, which is a unitary, centralized government, at least it has been in the past. And then there are the municipal or local governments that people vote for as well. Interestingly, since we're on this slide here, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, they also have the ability to vote for their own regional parliament. So there is a parliament or legislative body for Scotland, Wales, and at times there has been for Northern Ireland as well. This is known as devolution, trying to appease these smaller nationalist groups to let them basically have some sovereignty over themselves, allowed to have some control in particular. Uh, some people criticize this as just placating the minority groups within the system of the United Kingdom. Others say it's an important step towards sovereignty. The Scottish National Party uses it to their advantage to try to push for independence more. Uh, but never, nevertheless, devolution has been going on for the last few decades. When, when it comes to voting, the changing role of class and gender in British politics, as you can see here by this chart, ranging from 1974 to 2005. 
Uh, the percentage of voting labor has dropped as the number of unions have dropped, for instance. Uh, and you can see there's a big decrease because a lot of union members are actually voting conservative, for instance, in 1983. And the number of women, or at least the percentage of women voting for the Labor Party started out at 35, down to 26. Once again, the popularity of Margaret Thatcher and slowly going back up and it's been coming down a little bit. And here are some other differences just to go over some of the terms. In the United Kingdom, there's an unwritten constitution. It's a collection of documents. There's no one document that is just their constitution. It's unitary. So except for that devolution of power to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, all decisions are made in London by the House of Commons and administered and pushed through by the Prime Minister and their cabinet. There's a fusion of powers because the legislative and executive branch are one in the same. And it's a relatively strong system. United States, we have literally a written constitution. We have a federal system. So power is shared between the national and state governments. It's not a devolution of power. It's always been that way. And then there's the separation of powers, three distinct branches of government. And this basically makes the system a little bit weakened, especially when compared to the national government of Britain. In the United Kingdom, there's a dominant executive that is recruited from parliament and that's where a lot of their power comes from and the power to persuade is often the executive branch's greatest amount of power because they once again they can't propose laws to congress their power of persuasion is why they get elected and their power of persuasion is why they're able to sometimes convince congress to pass legislation that they favor and they can come from anywhere. They don't have to come directly from Congress. They don't have to come directly from one of the governors, even uh, someone with no military experience or elected, if elected experience can get elected presidents. And then the legislative branch. In there, it's mostly for debating and party voting. Like I said, when you have the majority, you can just rubber stamp everything. In Congress, though, they actually have to craft the laws. The prime minister and the cabinet bring laws proposed or bills directly from their party manifesto. In the case of making laws, though, that has to be designed specifically by the members of Congress. And the way they can get them done is often through coalition building. This happens internally in their parties and between parties in what's known as a bipartisan fashion. So those are some of the differences that exist between those two, branch, or those two styles of government. 